Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long book discussion between a guest host and the book's author. This week, primatologist Jane Goodall, famous for her work with chimpanzees, talks about her book Hope for Animals in Their World on the people and projects around the world who are helping to save endangered species. She discusses her book with John Nielsen, journalist and resident of the World Wildlife Fund. He's the author of Condor, To the Brink and Back, The Life and Times of One Giant Bird. Welcome, Jane Goodall. Thank you. Just to list the things that you have accomplished would probably take most of this interview, so we'll move through an abbreviated version of that. <laughs> Founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, the author of groundbreaking studies of the chimpanzees that you observed, uh, the author of several books, um, including Hope for Animals and Their World, which we are here to talk about today, and we might as well get to it. Um, this book is a series of case studies, and, and they are case studies of species that have so far been saved from extinction. Why did you write it? Why did you choose these particular species? I wanted to help people understand that in spite of all the doom and the gloom, and there's no question we have done so much damage to our planet, and it is right to be concerned and very concerned. But there are too many people who take this all aboard and therefore give up. They lose hope and decide it's not worth doing anything. And my crazy travel schedule, which takes me 300 days a year all over the world, has enabled me to meet some extraordinary people who've done some extraordinary things, who have become passionate about a particular species or even an ecosystem. And even when they're told, there's no way that you can save this, it's too late, they won't give up. And so these are success stories and they're deliberately selected, uh, mostly from the people I've actually met or had introductions to. The book could be many times longer. There's more stories than this. And in fact, some of the book is on our website. There wasn't, we, the publisher said, no, you have, to, you have to cut, you know, you can't have the, everything. So it's chosen to give people hope, to help people understand that even though uh, in some cases, we've reached almost the end of the road with a certain species. Just have some determination and some obstinacy and the courage, really, to withstand all those who say, oh, it's a waste of money, that uh, the animals will die, let them die with dignity in the wild, just leave them be. Uh, they, they refuse to listen, and they somehow find the money and the energy and save them. Well, you can see the passion uh, that the people who have been working to save these animals felt for them I in the names that they've given them. I, I was looking through and keeping track and th there, there are chapters about uh, Vancouver Island marmots named Oprah Winfrey and Franklin. There are whooping cranes named Tex and George. There are peregrine falcons named Scarlet and Rhett. This was, these are very personal issues to, to the people who are involved, uh, aren't they? I mean, uh, absolutely. And you know, it, it's interesting because, of course, when I began studying the chimpanzees, I had no idea that uh, from the point of view of strict science, I should have given them names, uh, not names, but numbers. And, well, I didn't know that. And it, <laughs> it seems ridiculous to me. So the chimpanzees all had numbers, and I described their personalities and their minds and their feelings. And when I got to Cambridge University to get my PhD, I was told this was all wrong. But thinking back to my childhood teacher, I knew that the scientists were wrong and I was right because that was my dog. And you can't have uh, some kind of animal share your life and not understand that of course they have personalities, minds and feelings, of course they deserve names. But even today, there are people who feel, and probably rightly, that if they start talking in these terms about their animal, they will be less eligible to get um, grants from certain organizations because it's too fluffy, it's too sentimental. It's not scientific. It's not scientific. Enough. And yet on the other hand, I, you might argue that uh, giving an animal a name might be a way to get 
more people to invest in that animal well, of to course it care is. about the future of, of that course animal. it is I mean you know sometimes writing this book it, it was too confusing to write about all these numbers I thought well you know I, I'm lost I've lost track of what is number 49 versus number 57 and so I gave them temporary names just for the purpose of the book I asked the biologist if they if they would mind and they said no they wouldn't some cases though Interestingly, people stop naming simply because they're reintroducing them into the wild and they have such a high uh, rate of, of loss that they feel they can't cope if they name them, so they just give them numbers. Well, I, perhaps you should give some examples of some of the species that, that you write about in this book. I, I found them also interesting. I, maybe you should just pick one. And uh, did you visit all of these places or most of them? But mm. where are some of the places you went? Uh, some of the more memorable. Yeah, I, I couldn't visit them all. But I certainly visited the whooping cranes. I visited the, uh, the sanctuary in, um, in Texas, where the first flock spends the summer. I uh, visited the Patuxent Breeding Center, uh, you know, near, in, near Washington, D.C. And best of all, I went and visited Operation Migration, where Joe Duff is teaching, well, and his helpers are teaching these cranes a new migration route. I got to go up in an ultralight. And so it was, you know, totally, totally fascinating. It, the, the whooping crane, of course, is a bird that went completely extinct in the wild. And no, was, no, 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 no. The, right? the original flock was down to 27. Ah. And they were summering in, in, in the Aransas Nature Preserve in uh -huh. Texas. And then they nested somewhere north in Canada, but nobody knew where. And all the time the flock was getting less and less. And then one day, uh, some helicopter pilot was spraying, or I don't know what he was doing, and he saw this white bird with uh, a golden colored young, and that's where they were. They were nesting in Wood Buffalo Park in Canada. But this little flock was down to 27. And, you know, 2,000 mile migration, getting less and less. If bird flu or something came along, then that would be the end of that. Right. So that was why they needed to start a second, um, a second group. But they had to teach them to migrate because they learned from their parents. And this was a new route. It was a, an ancient one, but no bird living knew it. So they trained them to follow the ultralight, like Bill Lashley trained Egyptian geese to start with. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that's, that's how that worked. I got mixed up with black-footed ferrets and black California footed, condors. Black-footed ferrets extinct in the wild, uh, California condor extinct in the wild, the pygmy rabbit extinct in the wild, so many of them. So these were all, but these, what these, all of these species do have in common, one thing, it seemed to me, was that they all were to the point where we could have written them off. We could have just said, Absolutely. forget it, let's pull the plug yeah. and go away, but it didn't happen. And some of the incredibly inventive things, such as using ultralights yeah. to teach mm. migratory rats. Yes. Uh, and my favorite story with one of them, with the whooping cranes, is uh, George Archibald, who's done so much for cranes worldwide. And they have this one female and she had genes that they really, really wanted for their captive breeding, but she'd been hand-raised, so she wouldn't mate with a crane. So George volunteered to do courtship dancing with her every day for, I think, something like a month, twice, and she did lay an egg, and they were able to artificially inseminate it. And so her genes are now all over the place. I love that story. It's and one of my favorite pictures in the book. When you when you first entered um, Tanzania, what equipment did you take with you other than a pen and a pad of paper? We couldn't afford much. It was on a shoestring. I mean, who was going to give money for this young, untrained girl? I mean, it was crazy, wasn't it? Yes. And Louis Leakey just went on and on, and finally, uh, a wealthy American businessman, Leighton Wilkie, said, all right, money for six months. We'll see what happens. The British authorities in what was then a British protectorate of Tanganyika, uh, this young girl, we will not take responsibility. And that's why I had to have a companion. And mum volunteered, which was amazing. You know, she was there for the first four months.